Life on the Road with Magic and Mayhem audio cast has been sort of an interesting experience. There are people who believe they are doing God's work and they openly feel they are doing it correctly. When a man like me walks in, I sound rather articulate. I am educated and yet I look a little scruffy. It's okay for me because I'm on the road and I don't much feel like shaving is not it. It's just that a large man can immediately know not to piss all over me when he sees my beard like this. And I am not that tall. You see, when men go out is very different than women go out. Women literally fear men all the time is somewhat true in the Christian life, I guess. You see, women tend to make more stink over a man being matter-of-fact with them and rebuking them for their illness. Now let's talk a moment about illness. What is illness in today's world? Well, there are many types of illnesses. There's physical ailments, there are stress-oriented ailments, and there literally are intellectual ailments. There are psychological ailments. There's many types of ailments that the Lord puts in our life for a lot of reasons. Some people get cancer and go on in life despite that. Some people get other types of illnesses and don't make it through the process of healing. The people who have faith in their life tend to heal a little better most of the time. My strong mom has battled cancer now four times and won. I have a sibling who I believe has seen the likes of cancer twice, and the others have had little scares with those sorts of things. I myself has simply died once and said, you know, God, I'm not really quite ready to go yet, literally, when I felt myself slipping through my own body. Now that's an interesting story for another day and perhaps one of my Magic and Mayhem speaking series events, but in reality what I'm talking about today is how it feels to be me in this moment of time. You see, the last moment of time for me was literally when I was in a home, in a townhouse that I loved, in a community that I could walk through completely to go get a great burger or to find some sushi or literally even to a donut shop. I loved the walking aspects of the life because when I lived abroad in Japan, I literally had to walk for my groceries or ride our bicycles as a family. We would take our basket bicycles, which I preferred to utilize, to carry our groceries home. We would buy one week's worth of groceries because the refrigerators in Japan are not like the large refrigerators here. You see, the refrigerators in Japan are a little bit larger than a bar refrigerator or perhaps a dorm room refrigerator that's of good size. Not the teeny little square ones, but I'm talking about the half size sort of refrigerator. In Japan, they're considered three quarters if they have a freezer on top and then literally that kind of bar size fridge underneath. The bottles in Japan are not two liters, they're one liter, and most, for the most part, you can only get a few bottles in on top of the food that you need for the week. Now, of course, there are modern homes and traditional homes that have large size refrigerators, but they cost thousands of dollars, literally more than ours. And it is absolutely true that their technological products tend to look a little bit more space age, a little bit more sleek, a little bit more fashionable than the clunky stuff that we have here in America. I can pretty much profess that that's probably still going on. It was when I was there years ago. The reality is that fax machines here were uglier than snot, and the ones in the Japan were sleeker than ever, but I couldn't bring it home with me because there was just too much to carry back to the States. And it cost way too much money to put it on a plane and ship it here. And who made the extra money at that point in a young college departed life was not that many people. So when I talk about my life then, or when I talk about my life now, I'm talking about the experiences and the moments of time of those life experiences. You see, each of us has a life story. For those of us who are approaching 50 years old, we have a millennial of lifetime, it feels like. We've got different periods or different decades of different aspects of our life. When we were with someone, when we were not, when we were either a part of an organization, when we were not, when we were working for a company, when we were not. And our life is like that. Life is about change. I have a lovely friend named Claudia who's a very gifted spiritualist who openly has prophetic gifts that is very unusual. But she literally can stand next to you and know precisely what's going on in your life, particularly if there's some mayhem. And she'll say, look, you need to kind of watch that thing right there because God is really telling you, take care of that issue right now. She has lived in great success in life, owning an airport and in abject poverty, according to her stories, and yet she always have learned to love the Lord in the through. Now, isn't that what life is about? When we get married, it's for 
in sickness and in health and in poverty and in wealth. And openly there's that wonderful mantra that every couple says, says if they don't write their own vows. I literally don't know what kind of vows that I would exactly write for the one that I love, but I'm sure that the Lord would move me to say something profound to make everyone feel why I love that individual as I do. But then there are other people in the world who want to take away that right to literally love someone. And that's something we're going to talk about later in another podcast or a speaking event on May, Mad, the magic of the Lord. Now, when I'm imperfect, it shows you that I'm a transparent individual. It shows you that literally I'm telling you part of my life story so that you feel like you sort of know who I am. That's something comical for me that I hear all the time from pastors and it is an excuse not to perform their duties for the poor. You see, they will literally say something like, what do I care whether or not you're poor or not? Or they'll little say, here's $20, this will help get you down the road. Kind of like what happened on that long tale that we've heard about with the Good Samaritan, where literally people passed by someone in need and the only a Good Samaritan stopped to help someone. It was a lovely story we heard as children. We've often heard it throughout our life as adults in, from the pulpit. But what does it really mean to help someone? You see, helping someone is actually helping them in a moment of time. It's helping them to feel whole in that moment of time. Today, I literally sat for four and a half hours, I believe, waiting for a church to open. I was led there because my car was having some trouble. The truth is my lemon car is literally falling apart. I'm seeing it more and more each day, and it's difficult for me because I am accustomed to having a working, operating vehicle of transportation to carry me safely and my passengers on our journeys to wherever it is that the Lord God has me go, whether it's to a teaching event or whether it's to practically work on my book in a local cafe or whether it's really to work on my audio files in the midst of nature like I am now. But in reality, what I'm thinking about totally is how do I make a magical day how do I make sure that the time is of the Lord's timekeeping and not my own? And sometimes I sit a long time and I get impatient, but then I realize I'm on God's time, not my own. That's a very different schedule management system than I used to utilize. I used to be scheduled literally every hour or by the quarter hour so that I knew exactly how I was managing my time, whether or not I was using it efficiently or not, or not, whether or not I was practically doing things professionally for someone and how much it cost in terms of my hours of service for that particular client. And openly, I tracked every little thing. Now, since I lost some people in my life, it sort of took a toll on me, and I wasn't able to keep those loved schedule books, the, G, uh, H, the <clears throat> G520s that I love so much from Dayminder and that type of series, that I literally could not do it as well. I'm sure I have a year or two where things look kind of blank just because I wasn't able to focus on those points of the day. Now, as I've struggled through my own homelessness and my own moving back into having employment or working in a service-oriented mode, I have gotten better and better at keeping that schedule book. I'm now tracking where I go. I'm tracking who helps me. I'm tracking what people might purchase a book for me of an old copy uh, of soft cover or literally who's done something for me. My biggest frustration with those books is Saturday and Sunday. They literally never give us a full day like we don't do as much work on a Saturday or Sunday as we do during the weekday, and that's not really true. They could easily fix that if they simply just put the uh, numbers on each edge of the book and left the middle sections free and let people kind of figure out where the dates and times are for each hour or put the numbers in the midst of the median of those cross lines. But in truth, I can't tell everyone how to market their self better, but I can help people to see opportunities to harvest. We have some wonderful opportunities this fall coming up for people to maximize their opportunities and relationships and to build new community relationships in their own way. Three holidays do that op opportunity quite well. We have All Hallows Eve, which is known to literally today as Halloween, which really should be an All Saints Day of sorts although I believe there is such a day like that. We also need to have more opportunities to talk to people at Thanksgiving. 
to praise God's name, to thank people for their efforts in our life, to serve our clients, to appreciate our employees, and literally to recognize those who put food on our table and roofs over our head. We also have then the coming winter season, literally Christmas for most Christians and um, <clears throat> Hanukkah for the Jewish folks. And then, of course, there's Kwanzaa and other types of named holidays for that celebration of the Nativity and other aspects of light that came into the world at that time or that became a part of history notations at that moment in time. I don't believe Christmas was actually that date, but it's been moved so that people are more understanding in the winter times and less uh, difficult to deal with probably when the snow hits and other things like that. I'm not sure why it got moved. But in truth, what I'm really talking about is how life is for a person who is educated, university degreed, some master's education, and openly a profess professional educator of sorts, a lay pastor who's ready to preach on a moment's notice about what he's experienced in terms of the magic of the Lord and what he can do if we submit it all. And then there is the mayhem that happens to people, like when we take a vehicle in to a mechanic and we look for something to be fixed, they fix that part, but then we leave and something else goes awry or something from our vehicle goes missing because staff haven't learned the laws of the land that we don't steal or the laws of the Bible of thou shall not steal. But maybe if I say this, it upsets mechanics, but I know who it upsets is the people who own those clothes, those things, those objects that they work their hard-earned dollars to produce for their life. Then when we talk like this, I have to tell stories about my journey. I literally talk about where I've been, who I've gone to see, and how they responded to me. This morning, I waited four and a half hours for a pastor to show up. By nine o'clock, I was able to meet an administrative staff person who literally gave me the time of day. She sat and talked with me for 20, 30 minutes. We got to know each other a little bit, but she got to know more about my story and the types of speaking that I do. She literally said, could I leave her some materials to show to the pastor, and would that be okay? And I said, well, I'm really looking to produce an event here because I've got a little car crisis that I've got to solve, and you know, the 30 or dollars I might earn a day to just keep myself going in life is, in terms of gas and food alone, is not going to handle this challenge I'm facing right now with tires ready to fall apart. And I'm not saying that so that the crapheads who ruined my vehicle this last time, forcing me to lose money that I was setting aside for something else in a tire purchase, will do it all over again. You see, there are monsters in the world who do things like that, but literally what I ended up doing was talking with this woman and she said, can I tell, can I communicate what's going on for you to the pastor? And I said, you know, I'd really prefer to introduce my issues myself and make an introduction myself and create a relationship myself. And she sort of heard that, but sort of didn't. And probably what ended up happening was saying, there's this man in the parking lot, he'd like to talk to you about XYZ. And then the pastor probably pursued it with more interrogation as opposed to simply going, wow, we've got a new person in our lot. Let me go out and meet them and welcome them to our church and see what we might do to serve them. That literally is not usually what happens when I visit any church looking like I do with this furry Jesus-like beard or um, modern-day biker beard or yuppie, a yupster look that some people call it. And some people have really complimented me. I've got some 20-somethings who've said, I really like how you dress. I love that vest. I love those rings. And they kind of go off, and I'm like, okay, I'm not a fashion guru by any means. I take my cues from the Lord, but that's okay. What I'm really talking about here is what this woman did. That finally, when the pastor arrived, I saw someone walking towards my vehicle. So that told me that I need to stop reading the book that I'm reading. I need to get out of the car like a man and put things away and literally be wait to be greeted. She approached me. She asked me if this was my name. And then she literally told me that she was going to give me $20 and send me on my way. Well, as a man who wanted to produce an event that would have produced for him at least $400, and possibly more to pay some other bills that I had going on if I had just been allowed one day to stand at their church while right before the service began to either sell some books or some faith fobs or something for sale that might have really helped me to solve my problem. And literally, they had a huge lot. So if I could have parked my car there for a little while, not being any intrusion on any child, any person, any woman, any man, but just be able to sit in the shade of the wonderful trees they had, and think about life and think about a pl my plan and figure out the next opportunity for me with either someone there or by myself, that would have been wonderful. 
then when you think about that they had a backyard to the property with literally a back drive where I could have really sat in safety in the middle of the night and slept soundly and not worried about being a disruption to any person in a neighborhood or any place in a in a shopping lot and then realizing that they actually had a back parsonage of sorts that didn't look like it was really used as a parsonage but I had been told by the um, administrative assistant that they literally host uh, homeless people three times a year and that they had a food pantry so right there I thought wow maybe I could have stayed there for a little while and had a safe place and could have served in some way in response to that kindness and maybe I could have literally gotten a little bit of food from that food pantry as she sorta of was alluding to was possible and then what happened was simple the pastor came out said she had been told about my story said that they didn't literally know me at all and therefore they couldn't possibly have me in their church or literally sitting in their lot and she gave me twenty dollars to send me on my way now, I've sort of already said that already but I'd like you to feel how it felt as a man I went there literally to produce an event that would solve a problem for me that literally could have been handled so differently of course a man is going to like hearing a yes but the reality is that the pastor didn't take any time to get to know me at all she didn't investigate me on her own accord she didn't say well that sounds like interesting hearsay I'm gonna go talk to him a little while and just get to know him and see how he feels and see whether or not I think this is a fit for our parsonage and whether or not this is gonna work for our parish and whether or not I like the mission vision and values of this man and whether or not I can really help him or not or whether or not there might be somebody in the congregation of our 200 and some 250 some people that literally might know how to help this man fix his little problem solve an issue that he's facing right now as he's on the mission for the Lord in his life not in my life but in his life you see the journey with Jesus as a particular pastor I know is writing a book on is really about how we show Jesus in our life how do we demonstrate that we're thinking about who that person is as a soul as opposed to just a number or just a beggar at the door it was sort of insulting to take that money but I checked with my angels and I they literally said receive the money this handles your food and your beverage and your gas for the day and so she literally did pay me a kindness but it was sort of insulting at the same time because it didn't allow me to meet anyone it didn't allow me to determine whether or not that church could become a home base for me at all going forward if I chose to stay in the Indianapolis area after some of this ordeal is over with it didn't literally give me the opportunity to serve in their contemporary service which isn't bringing in enough people exactly it didn't opportunity didn't give me an opportunity to meet any men like me who might realize that God is showing us signs all day long it didn't allow me to talk to the ladies of the church to say look there's a wonderful teacher neighborhood nearby here that might be able to help you to see the God signs in the world who will help you with your faith but keep you supportive of this church you see she didn't really think about all the possibilities of avenues of relationship all she saw was a pulper at the door and on behalf of her church on behalf of her congregation on behalf of her divination or her literal industry or her little affiliation of that type of church she literally said no to me so in one fell swoop of five minutes of after waking four and a half hours to talk to someone and build a relationship with someone I got dismissed in a matter of seconds compared to the other length of time I had been preparing for that conversation the Lord just told me to listen and to process it out and to feel as I often do that there are so many missed opportunities in life because some human being doesn't stop and go, go Lord what would you like me to do in this situation first I'm pretty sure she didn't pray because I was led there because I was led to believe that God would help me through there now he helped me to see a lot of things for my marketing and minutes type of audio cast and podcast series he certainly will help any pastor to realize what it feels like to a person coming into a church but the absolute reality is that help could have been provided even the most simplest form of it which was to allow me to use the internet so I could continue on my journey or find the resources that I need to fix my wheels or whatever it might have been but that priority wasn't on her mind all she said was that it was legal liability because there was children on the property and I thought you know what that's a bunch of bullshit because I have a child he might have been in that program and is she gonna say that every single man or just a man who's looking for something now when I swear it's a passionate man it doesn't mean that I'm belittling the Lord it doesn't mean that I'm being disrespectful to the Lord in my own home if you will 
because I'm literally sitting in my vehicle, which you can see on the video, and I'm literally looking at, all right, how do I produce some money for tomorrow so that I will eat tomorrow, that I'll have gas tomorrow, that I'll literally feel good about my life tomorrow. You see, all those things might have been solved with the help of 250 people. You see, a set of tires and a tow would cost about $400. If every single person bought one item for a dollar, I would have practically all the money I needed to do that. If only 100 people bought things for $2, it would be close. And literally, if someone had said, oh, listen, I'll help on that, don't worry about it, that might have been something else entirely. You see, we dismiss the businesses in our organization. We don't think about them because we're always tapping into them at times when we should not be. But that's just me. Now, this has been Blake Enson of Blaze Communications, LLC, saying thanks for listening. I hope you're having a productive and prosperous day, and I literally hope that you are walking Lord Jesus' life in everything that you do, everything that you say, and everything that you allow yourself to become in this world.